everybody, welcome back to uh, Kit's surprise, uh, her Christmas story. As you can see again, Kit and Margaret are reading the story to you for the holidays. I hope you're following along. I hope you're enjoying this. I know sometimes my reading can get kind of, I don't know. Anyways, um, we're on chapter three today, but if you remember so far, we've, in chapter one, Rick Rack, Kit and Ruthie overheard their parents talking about possibly being evicted from their home and their house being foreclosed on. And then yesterday's chapter, chapter two, the red dress. Ruthie really enjoys their Christmases that they have together, their Christmas tradition. And so as we learned in chapter one, Kit says they probably won't get to do it due to the fact that they have no, really no money to do extra things and other, you know, pay bills and so on. And so Ruthie tries to make nice in her, by, by paying for the ballet and the lunch and giving Kit her old dress, red Christmas dress as a Christmas present to Kit and her mother. But Kit feels that uh, Ruthie just doesn't get it. So, unfortunately, they get in this fight. They don't know. They're saying they no longer want to be friends with each other. And we go from there. So that's where we left off yesterday. Today's chapter is called, we're on chapter three. And it's called The Wicked Ogre. Now, stay with me, guys. This chapter is a little longer than the other two. I think there's four chapters in each book. I'm trying to see. So, okay. Okay, so yeah, this chapter, if, this chapter, because I've read this book before, this chapter feels to be the longest in this book. So stay with me and we'll get through it. But it's called Chapter 3, The Wicked Ogre. Kit couldn't allow herself to cry for long. She knew that all afternoon chores were waiting for her. And Mother liked to give the kitchen floor a good scrub every Sunday night because there wasn't time during the week. Kit rolled over and sat up in, on her bed. She saw Amelia Earhart smiling at her from the newspaper photograph near her desk. Come on, Kit, Amelia seemed to say. Gotta get up and go. Even though she still felt miserable, Kit wiped her eyes, blew her nose, and went downstairs to the kitchen. Mother had already put the chairs up on the kitchen table. She was filling a bucket with hot soapy water at the sink. She turned to greet Kit with a smile. But her smile faded when she saw Kit's eyes red from crying. Oh, Kit, darling, she said. She dried her hands on her apron as she hurried over to put her arms around Kit. Was it that bad at Uncle Hendricks then? He's so fussy and that awful, what's his name too, the Scotty dog? Inky, Kit said. Mother smelled a soap suds and Kit let herself lean against her. He hates me. The way to that dog's heart is through his stomach, said Mother. I've got some cheese rinds in the pantry. Even I can't figure out how to make them edible. You can give them to Inky tomorrow when you go there after school. That'll win him over. Thanks, Mother, said Kit, not very cheered. That's not all that's wrong, is it? asked Mother. No, admitted Kit. Ruthie and I had a fight. I see, said Mother. What about? Kit poured out the whole story about Ruthie's bright red dress and the ballet tickets and the invitation to tea. It was wrong of me to say no for you, too, she said, but I couldn't help it. I was just so mad, Kit sighed. It used to be easy to be friends with Ruthie. It isn't anymore. Mother nodded. Your lives are very different now, she said. Things that are possible for Ruthie are not possible for you. The truth is, said Kit, I am jealous of her. And she, said Ruthie, is jealous of you. Of me? asked Kit, surprised. But I'm the one who's lost everything. Why would she be jealous of me? Oh, I don't know, said Mother. I've had the impression that Ruthie envies you for having the borders around, like a big interesting family. It's awful quiet at her house. And maybe she envies how your life is more grown up now. People trust you to do things. I never thought of it that way, said Kit, sighing. All I know is that I'm sorry about the fight. I wish we could use a telephone, said Mother. The telephone had been turned off because they couldn't afford to pay the bill anymore. Then you could call Ruthie and tell her that you're sorry. 
Well, you'll see her at school tomorrow. You can make it better then. Do you think so? asked Kit, hopefully. Of course, said Mother. It is never too late to repair a friendship. Mother lifted the pail of hot water out of the sink. Let's scrub this floor now, she said. I'm afraid it's never too late for that either. Mother was wrong. Kit was not able to patch things up with Ruthie the next day. Ruthie didn't stop to pick her up before school, and every time Kit tried to get Ruthie's attention during the morning, Ruthie turned away or hid herself in a group of girls. At lunchtime, in desperation, Kit wrote Ruthie a note and put it on her desk. She watched unhappily as Ruthie glanced at it, picked it up in two fingers as if it were a dead toad, and tossed it unopened and unread into the waste paper basket. Then Ruthie, then Ruthie sashayed off to lunch with a bunch of girls who were in her dancing class. Kit used to be in the dancing class too, but she'd had to drop out when her family couldn't afford that anymore either. Everyone at school noticed that Ruthie was shunning Kit. Sterling, who was actually pretty nice for a boy, tried to help. Here, he said to Kit, give this to Ruthie. He handed Kit a picture he had drawn. The picture showed Kit flying an airplane like Amelia Earhart's. The passenger in the airplane was Ruthie, dressed as a princess. Thanks, Sterling, Kit said, but she was afraid to give the drawing to Ruthie after what she said about princesses being babyish. So Kit put Sterling's drawing away in her book bag. After three days of getting the cold shoulder, Kit gave up. It was clear that Ruthie was too mad to forgive her. She wouldn't even give Kit a chance to apologize. When Ruthie had said they couldn't be friends anymore, she'd meant it. School closed for vacation, and Kit and Ruthie still hadn't spoken. Usually, Kit loved Christmas vacation because it meant she had more time to spend with her family and Ruthie. But this year, all it meant was that she had more time to spend with Uncle Hendrick and Inky. Uncle Hendrick still claimed he felt poorly, so every morning, after doing her chores at home, Kit went to his house. She walked there and back so she could give the streetcar fare. Her pile of nickels was growing. But that was not the only thing about going to Uncle Hendrick's house. Good gracious, you careless child. Don't use so much string, Uncle Hendrick fussed at her one day as Kit was tying up a bundle of newspapers for him. Do you think string grows on trees? I suppose you learned your wasteful ways from your spendthrift parents, he snorted. They think that money grows on trees. Holes in their pockets, those two. Kit bit her lip to stop herself from saying to, saying to Uncle Hendrick, that's not true. He never missed a chance to be critical of her parents. He lectured her about how they deserved their poverty because they'd been extravagant and lived beyond their means. It made Kit furious. Some, sometimes she thought Uncle Hendrick was trying to make her mad on purpose to, so that she wouldn't come back. But Kit would be honorary too. The meaner Uncle Hendrick was, the more determined she was not to give up. She wouldn't give him that satisfaction. At the end of every day, Uncle Hendrick had errands for her to do on her way home. Every errand came with lots of fuss, budgety instructions. Take these shoes to be stained, Uncle Hendrick commanded one blustery day. Here's a dime to pay for it. He shook his finger at Kit. Tell the man that I demand good value for my money. Sorry, guys, I'm turning the page. <laughs> the last time he left a scuff mark on the toe. Tell him, don't think I don't see it. Yes, sir, said Kit. She put the shoes in her book bag and the dime in her pocket. Leave these shirts with the laundry, said Uncle Hendrick. Tell them to put starch on the collars and cuffs only. And tell them that I don't want to see any buttons broken like the last time or I'll deduct the cost of the buttons from their bill. Yes, sir, said Kit. Goodbye. She gathered up the shirts, put on her coat, and left. The laundry was the closest, so Kit dropped off the shirts first. Then she trudged along to the shoe shine shop. Where she got there, a terrible sight met her eyes. There was a big handwritten lettered sign in the door. Out of business. Closed till the depression is out of business, too. Kit stood there in the bitter cold, wondering what to do. One thing was sure. Uncle Hendrick would bite her head off and howl worse than Inky if she brought his shoes back unfinished, unshined. So Kit took the shoes home. 
was in her dad's rags and polish, she shined them herself, rubbing until her arms ached. She carried the shoes back to Uncle Hendrick's house the next day, bracing herself for his persickety words of criticism. Before she could explain, Uncle Hendrick took the shoes from her. There, he said, that's what I call a job well done. Let that be a lesson to you, Kit. You only get your money's worth if you insist upon it. Kit hid a smile. Here's your dime back, she said. Shop was closed. I shined the shoes. You, said Uncle Hendrick. He studied the shoes again, then narrowed his eyes at her. Then you earned the dime, he said. Keep it. Kit put the dime in her pocket. Then she faced Uncle Hendrick bravely. Uncle Hendrick, she said, I've been thinking. May I work for you? If I pick up your groceries, may I keep the tip you usually give the delivery man? If I deliver your letters, may I keep the cost of the stamps? And if I... Stop, shouted Uncle Hendrick. You pester the life out of me. Get this straight once and for all, child. I don't care who does the work, as long as it's done to my satisfaction. You may keep any money you earn. Understand? Yes, sir, said Kit. Good, said Uncle Hendrick. Now don't bother me about that again. That was all Kit needed to hear. Starting then, whenever she could, Kit did Uncle Hendrick's jobs herself. She polished his shoes. She delivered his letters. She fetched his groceries. She brought him his newspaper. She washed his windows and then washed them all over again because Uncle Hendrick said he saw streaks. Kit wanted to earn enough money to pay the electric bill, which she knew was about $2.35. Every day she counted up the money she'd earned to see how close she was getting to her goal. Five days before Christmas Eve, Kit had $1.55. She needed 80 cents more. She knew she could earn 10 cents a day by walking instead of riding the streetcar. That would be 50 cents. But it was going to be tough to earn the last 30 cents. Still, Kit was determined. Even though Uncle Hendrick's chores were hard, the winter streets were often slippery and the winter darkness came earlier and earlier. But Kit kept saying to herself, Think how surprised Mother will be when I give her the money I've earned. The thought kept her going when the cold wind made her eyes water and slush seeped through her shoes and froze her feet. Sometimes Kit had to take dreadful old Inky win with her when she did her errands. He'd, win, he'd wind his leash around her legs and try to trip her, or roll in a puddle and then shake so that cold, dirty water splattered all over her. The clink of coins in her pocket helped Kit put up with Inky and with Uncle Hendrick even when he was at his most cantankerous. There was one errand Kit liked to do, even though it didn't earn her any money. Every few days, Uncle Hendrick sent her to the public library to return his books and pick up new ones the librarian set aside for him. The huge public library seemed like a hushed, warm haven to Kit, filled as it was floor to ceiling with books. Unfortunately, she never had time to linger there. Uncle Hendrick was always in a hurry to get his books, which seemed odd because they were so dull and boring they always put him to sleep. It was during the afternoons while Uncle Hendrick dozed that Kit thought about Ruthie the most. She missed Ruthie. It would have been such a comfort to talk to her. She understood how hateful Inky was and how impossible Uncle Hendrick was. One especially long afternoon, Kit sat watching Uncle Hendrick snore in his chair. One of his dull books had put him to sleep. Inky was contently tearing the cover off Charlie's tennis ball. Kit reached into her book bag, only to find that she'd left the book she wanted to read at home. Instead, she pulled out a pad of paper. It was Sterling's sketch pad, the one he'd used when he made sketches of Kit as Amelia Earhart and Ruthie as a princess. Kit looked at the sketches. Then, without planning to, she began to write. Once upon a time, she began, and then the story seemed to sweep her away. It wasn't the kind of story she usually wrote for her newspaper. This story was not about facts. It didn't report what was really happening. This story was about a completely different world. The kind of world Ruthie liked, a world that was imaginary. In this world, Kit could make anything she wanted to happen, happen. While she was writing, Kit forgot she was stuck in Uncle Hendrick's dreary house. She forgot about her family's money troubles 
and the fact that the boarders might leave and that her family might be evicted from their house. All that disappeared while she was in the world of her story. When Uncle Hendrick woke up and blinked, his eyes open, Kit felt herself snap back into the real world. It was as if she were wa waking up to from a wonderful dream. Kit hurriedly shoved the sketch pad back into her book bag, thinking Ruthie was right. Make-believe does make your troubles disappear for a while. Kit wished she could tell Ruthie that she understood about make-believe. Then Kit remembered that she and Ruthie weren't friends anymore. They weren't even speaking to each other. After that first afternoon, Kit wrote more of her story every day. She began to look forward to her writing time when the only sounds in the grim old house were Uncle Hendrick's snores, the hollow ticking of the clock on the mantel, and Iki's slobbery snuffles. Soon, Kit began to see that writing made all of her day better. She thought about her story when she was outside doing errands, and it distracted her from the cold and her tired feet. She paid close attention to how things looked or smelled or sounded, trying to find out the right words to describe them for her story. When Uncle Hendrick woke up and fussed at her, it didn't bother her anymore. She listened carefully in case she wanted to use anything he said in her story, because Kit had discovered that Ruthie had been right about something else too. There was a wicked ogre in Cincinnati, Uncle Hendrick. Okay, it wasn't as long as I thought. It was about our normal... 20 minutes. That's how long it takes me to read one of these chapters. So we have chapter four coming up and there might, now see, I'm thinking maybe it's chapter four that seems to be the longest. Okay. So chapter four is going to be our last chapter. So, and it is the longest chapter. At least it feels like the longest. One of them does. <laughs> Anyways, guys, I hope you really are enjoying Kit's stories. Uh, and from once we get done with Kit, maybe we'll do Samantha. I'm not sure. I haven't looked to see who's will be the next story that we'll do. I have Molly's um, story, and I have, like I said, I have, I have Samantha's story, and we have Molly's story, so we'll see where we go from here. Guys, enjoy your day. Enjoy your evening. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy, whenever you hear this, I hope everything's going well. Your holiday season is peaceful, and you're taking the time to enjoy your family, friends, and just, you know, Get that warm, hot cocoa, whatever you do to to enjoy the evening. Anyways, guys, I do appreciate you. Thank you so much for all you've done for us. We're um, so close to 400. Like I said, that's my goal. We're at 334, I saw. And it would just be so cool if we hit 400 by the end of the year. And I want to say thank you to all of you. Happy holidays. You guys are thought of and appreciated, and we do appreciate every single one of you who comment, who listen, who post a thumbs up, like. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much for making our YouTube experience a happy one. We'll see you all on the flip side. Bye, guys.